Hello everyone, Tom Jirasi here with Rem870.com. Today we had the humbling experience to speak to Mike Lamb of Stoic Ventures. Take a listen. Okay, and we are live. So uh, I'll start with uh, the first question, and that is, uh, what do you think about the Remington 870 shotgun? Yeah, it's a great platform. I mean, it is the most versatile and most violent platform in the small arms arsenal, hands down. I mean, um, if, yeah, if some think. weird, yeah, some weird ordinance came through and you were only allowed to have one firearm, I, you know, I'd be inclined to take that 870 because there's nothing else that I could sit there and take dove, quail, whatever, feed my family, uh, you know, or pull a brown bear in half with, you know, with with the right munitions choice. So it's definitely it's just so versatile, and you know, it's it's kind of a jack of all trades. What do you think about the use of a shotgun for home defense? Uh, I think it's fantastic. Um, but, you know, a lot of people will counter that point. And you, what it comes down to is training. If you don't train, well, I don't care what platform you have or don't have or you don't have a plan for home defense, um, you need to have those things. You need to have training. You need to have a plan. Uh, I've got a firm belief. Uh, all my students that I train, I, uh, I let them know we've got control over two things in a gunfight in a dynamic stress situation. And that's ourselves and our equipment. And you got to master both. You need to understand what your body's going to do under dynamic stress. You need to understand incapacitation uh, for yourself as well as other targets. And you need to understand the proper munitions, the proper equipment, the proper accessories for whatever you're using for home defense. Yeah. And shotguns are so fickle that yeah, you really need to understand it. you got to train with it. Uh, your 870 could have a sequential serial number to my 870. We could both put the same lot number ammo in there and get different patterns at different distances. It's just mm -hmm. for such a rudimentary tool, there's no more fickle animal out there than a shotgun. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, you know, one of the other problems that get thrown in into that question is, you know, which type of ammo, you know, are people going to be using in over-penetration? So I think you sure. answered it perfectly, you know. With training, I feel, you know, yeah, you can definitely get away with using almost any type of ammo as long as you know, you know, what's behind that target, you know, what that round is going to do to your potential target. And uh, I, would, I would have to definitely agree. And uh, my next question for you, uh, Mike, is what, what, what upgrades do you recommend most for the 870 platform? It depends on what you're going to do with it. Now, if you're just a recreational shooter, um, you know, you're going to go take training classes, different things like that. The best one thing that you can do with that shotgun is get a shorter stock put on it. Um, most of us shoot a shotgun in the pocket of our shoulder. We put the butt stock right up against that ball joint of our shoulder, and we run the mm -hmm. gun. That's the reason why most people don't train with shotguns, because it's going to beat the ever-living hell out of you if you mm -hmm. shoulder the weapon like that. Now, if you square up to the gun, you bring it inboard, have it below your clavicle but on your chest so it's flat up against your chest, and even for female shooters that it's above the breast tissue, that they can have the entire surface area of that buttstock square up against them to better, more surface area to better absorb that trauma from the recoil. Now, that's a that huge thing. It's going it's gonna, to gonna keep you squared on target for a follow-up shot if necessary. It's going to allow you to cover that target so you can assess, you know, what you just did. Is that target incapacitated? Is it temporarily immobilized? What does it need? Um, you know, it allows you to problem solve. So it's just one of those things that solves so many problems, uh, whether, like I said, whether for home defense or going out there and training. Now, home defense, I would caveat that shorter stock with having a light mounted somewhere on that weapon. Uh, now, 870 specifically, you know, a handheld light is almost out of the question. Is it possible if you train with it? Absolutely. But some type of weapons-mounted light, whether it be mounted on the magazine tube, uh, you know, right there in front of the lug of the barrel or mounted on the forend, something, you can't shoot what you can't see. And the reason why I named my company Stoic Ventures is that the Stoics believe that emotions were destructive. And I've seen, you know, I did, I named my company that because to honor my brothers that didn't come back or that got wounded, most of them, a lot of them got hurt because somebody acted out of an emotional decision, whether that emotion was fear or that emotion was rage. Or a lot of times in home defense situations where people are not trained or they're not first or they do not have experience in combat, 
they're automatically going to go to fear. Uh, best analogy I can give you is what do you do, most people do, when they hear a bump in the night? Well, I, mean, uh, I get all kinds of answers, yeah. you know, yeah, I'm going to get the gun. Yeah, but before that, something happens. Before that, Definitely most fear. of us, Definitely fear. We, we, we listen as hard as we can. Not that we can listen any harder than we already do, but we're like, wait, what is that? Maybe it's going to happen again. Maybe they're, and we're trying to gather information to process into intelligence so we can form our decision matrix. So Definitely. that being said, we fear what we don't know. And if I hear something, I don't know what it is, yeah, I'm going to be inclined to believe that it's the boogeyman or the big bad wolf that's at the door. Right. Um, but it could be a myriad of other things. You know, in recent events, we've had just terrible tragedies occurring where people are at home and they might have children of college age or high school sneaking back into the house. Or, hey, mom, dad, I came home from the weekend from college. And, you know, terrible things happen because people act out of fear. And if you don't have that light to positively identify the target and identify friend or foe, you're in a very libelous position to maintain a firearm for home defense because you're just operating out of a fear basis instead of a problem-solving basis. Right. So with correct uh, training, you feel that we can master, master definitive choices in situations like that? You can, because as you're exposed to these different things, it you're going to have better tools to problem solve. Now, what that does, your problem solving matrix, it's going to compress that window of time so you can do these things faster. The more time you have in any threat situation, time is life. So yeah. the more time you preserve to make actions against the objective or problem solve, whatever it is, you're going to set yourself up for success. So right. through training, we can master that. You know, through the manipulating of the weapon, through staging of the, how's the weapon staged? Where's it positioned? Where is it in relation to you, to the door, to where the threat area is, or the most likely avenue of approach for a home invasion, or, you know, if you're sleeping, if you're in the living room. I mean, there's, there's so many different venues. A lot of people just have it kind of conceived that, hey, I've got the gun by the bed because, you know what, it's going to happen at nighttime. Well, the majority right. of home invasions happen right in the middle of the day because they're hoping you're at work. But the biggest problem why we're hearing more and more about home invasions is because the economy's tight. But two, a lot of people work from their homes now. So the conventional nuclear family where mom and pop, you know, go off to work, the kids are at school, nobody's home, and, you know, Mickey the meth head comes in, it's, it's not the case. People right. work from home all the time. Yeah. So they find themselves in compromising positions, and it's like, hey, wait, I'm not in my bedroom where the weapon is for home defense. That's on the other side of the house. Right. So what's your plan in that circumstance? You know, a firearm is a great tool to defend. But, you know, sometimes it's, it's best to just relocate yourself and remove yourself from the threat. Um, you know, it's, it's easy to talk a big game about meeting violence with violence, but if I don't have a family member and my dog is not in harm's way, I'm just going to leave. I've got nothing to prove. Right. <laughs> and I'll sit there and, you know, I'll, I'll call the cops. Hey, yeah, uh, yeah, there's these three guys. Here's what they're wearing. Here's the vehicle. Yeah, I'm sitting over here uh, eating a sandwich, watching these right. guys steal my shit. Not worry about it. All my guns yeah. are locked up in a safe. They need my flat screen that bad. It's not worth me smoke checking three of them and having all kinds of ridiculous dry cleaning bills, the media at my house, right. firearms trainer, you know, smoke oh, yeah. three dudes. I, I don't need that. And especially if my family's in the house, I don't need to be paying for their freaking therapy bills because I just dusted three people. Yeah. Um, you know, now if they're in harm's way, great. And then I'll lead them out, you know, a different way from where the bodies are. One, not to contaminate the crime scene. Two, they don't need to see that shit. So, you know, you know I'm not overseas anymore. <laughs> I got so, I got jack so, shit to prove. So what kind of drills do you recommend most for for us or civilians, ex-military, any, anybody really? What kind of shotgun drills would you recommend most? One, I'd recommend just maneuverability. You know, working in tight spaces, it's really easy to get out to an open bay range, and you've got all the room in the world to move around and not stay tight with the weapon and, you know, all that type of stuff. But, you know, just like how we would do hundreds of rehearsals before we would go on missions, uh, you know, going through structures, clearing structures, things like that, getting in there and, you know, it sounds weird and I, it's not I'm wearing a tinfoil hat, but, you know, practice moving throughout your home with that weapon. Practice bringing it up. Practice shouldering it, you know, whether – you know, you're at a high port or a depressed muzzle as you're, you know, mm -hmm. moving around, as you're doing your search 
as you're going through movement, movement to the objective, that type mm-hmm. of thing. Practice bringing the gun up, you know, moving with a gun. So it becomes right. an extension of you. So many people become foreign with it. I would also, you know, as part of that, you know, practice working that safety, you know, especially on an 8.7. You got that cross bolt safety. And a lot of times I see it all the time at class when nobody's shooting at you and nobody's trying to kill your wife. We're just, bring, you know, we're doing come-up drills and getting on target and, you know, mm-hmm. just practice weapon mani- manipulation and marksmanship. Mm-hmm. But guys will forget to sweep the safety. So part of that, you know, with your shooter's checklist is as that gun comes up, you sweep the safety. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, we have our four firearm safety rules. Well, some of the other side of the coin for that, the second firearm safety rule, never point your weapon anything you do not intend to destroy. Third firearm right. safety rule, finger straighten off the trigger until you're ready to fire. Well, I've got a flip side of that coin. I call them life safety rules. You know, if I point, my, I'm sweeping that safety on whatever weapon system I'm running if I point it at somebody. There's no way in hell I'd point a weapon at somebody unless I intended to shoot them. They had crossed some lines in the sand that necessitated, necessitated me to point that weapon at them. So why would I do that with a safety on? Right. And finger straighten off the trigger until you intend to fire. Well, why would I point a weapon at any target unless I intended to fire? Whether I'm doing dry fire practice or I'm neutralizing a threat, it's the same game. So, you know, getting into that type of practice where I'm working the life safety rules and being aware of that, um, too, knowing when that trigger's going to break. You know, being yeah, aware of that as line. you're running the gun. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, it's definitely. a lot of people just slam on that gas pedal. They jerk the trigger. And mm-hmm. even with a shotgun, you might have a more surface area pattern. But at close ranges, you know, look at what flight control does at five, seven, ten yards. I mean, you're, you're essentially within a one-inch group at mm-hmm. those distances. So the myth of, hey, honey, I'm going out of town, shotgun's in the corner, anybody comes in, just point it at him and press the trigger, is complete and utter nonsense. Joe right. Biden certainly didn't help that. Definitely. So, um, Mike, can you tell us more about uh, Stoic Ventures? Yeah. Uh, you know, we train vetted uh, civilians, we train law enforcement, we train military, uh, contractors, uh, all the same. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's, you know, whatever platform they want to learn, whether it's, uh, you know, pistol, carbine, Basically shotgun. Pretty much, uh, whether you got a short-range game or you want to do long-range. Uh, our long-range classes, uh, the farthest we've taken guys out to engage a target, uh, we had students with 308s engaging an 18-inch steel plate at 2,381 yards. So um, it all comes down to the fundamentals, and it's the same fundamentals if you're using you know, a shotgun. Mm-hmm. It, it's all the shooting. The fundamentals don't change. So the more practice you get with whatever platform you have, you can apply that to the shotgun. You can apply it to the pistol, to precision rifle, carbine. It's it's the same game. So the more you get out there, the more trigger time you get, you know, it's just going to make you a better shooter overall. And if you can yeah. incorporate that mindset of, in, you know, understanding incapacitation, understanding terminal ballistics uh, mm-hmm. for munition selection, whatever platform you're doing, um, you know, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to put you way ahead of the power curve. Mike, uh, can you explain uh, just a few of the guns you own personally and, and possibly your top three favorites? Um, yeah, you know, my, my favorite, you know, my go-to is my M4. I mean, that thing was, was my teddy bear overseas. I, mm-hmm. It was my primary weapon system as it was with pretty much all of us over there. Um, when you're employed as a sniper, uh, your, your sniper rifle is sometimes your primary, other times it's a tertiary. Because you're carrying it, you know, to go insert into your hide and doing advanced work, you know, sneaking in there and all that good stuff. And then you got your pistol as your secondary. So um, those are great. Uh, other times, you know, using the, the shotgun, we use that overseas uh, inside of structures. We used it for VBSS, for maritime missions. Shotgun's a great tool. Um, the one thing I do have noticed about a shotgun and I don't have any scientific data to back this up, but this is just going off of my own personal experience. Uh, different war zones that we'd operate in inside of structures, especially, uh, which is really the only time I'd use uh shotgun in an offensive role in my experience. So inside of structures, uh, you know, the, the crack of a rifle, the pop of a pistol type of thing, uh, the enemy seemed 
pretty inoculated to that. But the sound of that shotgun going off inside of a structure seemed to have a very damning psychological effect on them. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, and I don't know why. Uh, I don't teach psychological incapacitation because I don't know right now if you and I were standing next to each other, if I reached over and started tickling you, whether you'd laugh or you'd punch me and break my nose. I don't know. <laughs> you know, we don't know what makes people tick. So right, uh, right. just in my experience, uh, that was a phenomenon that occurred only with a shotgun. That did not occur when, you know, we were running M4s, uh, sub guns, pistols, things like that. Uh, you know, it, it did occur with a shotgun, which, which I always found very interesting and intriguing. Awesome, awesome. But uh, yeah, my, my my top weapons, yeah, probably you know my go to is that M4. I, bottom line is I got more trigger time on that than any other oh, yeah. weapon. You're very platform. well versed with it. And yeah, and you know after that, I'd say, you know, pro, you know my you know a pump gun, a good pump gun. Mm-hmm. Uh, I love I love my my 870s. I got a bunch of 870s. Uh, you know I like Mossbergs a lot too. I'm naturally mm-hmm. a southpaw, so that tang safety. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a little easier for me to manipulate when I'm working in through structures and fighting re- left-handed, fighting right-handed, things right. like that, as I'm using that angle when we're coming in, clearing, you know, doorways and moving down hallways and things like that. So, um, you know, I did appreciate that. Uh, just took a little bit more training and practice to do that with an H70. Both great mm-hmm. platforms, both very reliable, not ammunition sensitive. I mean, you can load them up, ready, prepare, do whatever you need. And, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, so I'd go M4, uh, pump gun, and then a precision gun. Right now, the, my favorite precision caliber is a, a kind of a hot-rodded one that Robar built for me, which is a, in 375. And that wow. one is doing five and three-eighths inch groups at 1,400 yards. So I'm really really pleased with the way that that rifle performs. Yeah, it's, it's yeah that's a great really rifle. impressive. That's awesome. Mike, can you, uh, can you tell us about your video, Make Ready with Mike Lamb, Intro to Shotgun? Yeah, basically uh, what I do is it's I explain three things. You know, I go over the weapons manipulation. Uh, I go over the marksmanship, especially with the recoil mitigation techniques because that comes into play when you're shooting shotguns because that those munitions are moving down the barrel at such a slow speed in comparison to a carbine, um, mm-hmm. and even in some cases pistols. Mm-hmm. But the barrel's so much longer that if you don't have proper recoil mitigation techniques and you're riding that recoil, it's going to pull you off target before that right. munition even leaves the barrel. So we go over that, and then the third part is really just kind of going through myth-busting and explaining what makes the shotgun bitching, or just different tweaks you can do to your existing shotgun to make it, you know, just a, a great platform for whatever you want to do with it. Right. Uh, you know, for the purposes of that video, it's specifically geared towards, you know, a defensive application or a military law enforcement application. Mm-hmm. So, it's a it's 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 a great tool. Um, it's so misunderstood. So uh, I'd like to think I did a pretty good job on kind of myth busting a lot of uh, prevailing uh, erroneous information that's out there. And I do work yeah. with like you know a lot of weapons manufacturers and you know, as a consulting guy um, when I'm not doing the training. So and I get a lot of this stuff directly from them. So this is not the pseudoscience. This is me working directly with manufacturers and we work mm-hmm. together to try and make better platforms for people and yeah, you know, awesome. make shooting more enjoyable and more proficient. Do you have any other just random advice for uh, shotgun users, maybe, you know, really inexperienced all the way to super experienced? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, big thing, guys, when I go over this in the video, when we start talking about ammunition selection for the for home defense, mm-hmm. guys, stay away from the slugs. Uh, stay away from the slugs. You know, people are like, well, what if I need to take a long shot? Well, if you need to take a long shot, chances are that guy's probably running away from you and he's no longer a threat. So there's not necessarily a need to engage. Or they're already running away, and that goes from defense to manslaughter. So we're staying off right. of that stuff. We're staying on the good guy side of the house, and, and that's what it's about. Uh, the other thing, too, is keep the same load in your shotgun because you're not going to remember, oh, my first one's rock salt, my second one's bird shot, my third yeah. one's high brass pheasant low, then my fourth mm-hmm. one's buckshot, my fifth one's a slug. That's nonsense. Um, you know, just the phenomena that occurs under dynamic stress, you're just, you know, you're gonna, the time distortion, you know, things are going to be moving real fast or real slow. It's called tachypsyche. It just really alters the state of your perception because you got these chemicals flowing through your body. You know, you got right. dopamine, cortisol, adrenaline, all these things flowing through your body, and you're going to feel like the first time you did when you got drunk. 
you know, and you're like, whoa, hey, I just had two beers, and no, my life's crazy. That's what's Mm going to happen. And under that, you're not going to remember what you had what. Or, you know, if somebody does cross that line in the sand and you press that trigger and you give them a chest full of rock salt, well, I don't even know where the hell you get a rock salt load, uh, or birdshot. I mean, it's going to ruin their T-shirt, but it doesn't have the mass to penetrate anything and hit any arteries or major organs in the thoracic cavity. You mm-hmm. shoot him in the face, maybe he'll get his eyes, but, you know, criminally you might be found innocent. But then civilly, hey, they might come after you for maiming their client. Right. And, you know, now now the poor scumbag that broke into your house can't see, and you got to pay him, you know, 300 bucks a week for the rest of your uh, rest of his life because he's, yeah. he's you know, totally disabled. Yeah, you know, so, you know, go out there, check out some loads. When you get the loads, you know, pattern your shotguns. We go over that in the video. It's like zero in your rifle, but it's right. for specifically the shotgun. Because there, no two shotguns will pattern alike. load that you would recommend most for, Absolutely. Uh, say, home defense? Absolutely. Absolutely, and this is uh, this goes off of uh, Dr. Gary Roberts, uh, who's you know a great ballistician and you know good dude. He comes out and trains with us periodically. Uh, but if you're able to read some of his ballistic reports that he puts out for terminal ballistic performance, uh, he's got uh, the federal number one buckshot light control rated as his top choice uh, for the amount of trauma that it induces, and it's all scientific. It's empirically backed. It's not, you know. Some some guy just he got bored and mixed up ballistic gel tin. This is quantified data from a medical doctor. Wow. So it's 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 good reads. If you get Doc Roberts reports, uh, you know, or just look them up, you 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 could find uh, some of the open source ones, not the military law enforcement ones available online. You know, I'd advocate that for you and you know uh, your readers and all that stuff that just get yeah, out there and check good. it out. But yeah, the flight control is my favorite. Uh, number one buck, it's kind of like the Holy Grail. It's very hard to find. You, essentially, mm-hmm. you get 15 pellets. Um, induces, you know, a lot of trauma. The double op buck is also great, but you do risk more over penetration um, with that. So my number one go-to is, uh, yeah, Federal's number one buck flight control, hands down. That's a that's a very great piece of advice. Uh, Mike, uh, the, last, the last question I got for you is, uh, do you think muscle mass? I know that you're a pretty, you're a pretty built-up guy. Uh, do you think muscle mass helps contribute a lot to uh, recoil reduction when shooting the shotgun? Yes and no. Um, does it help? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, am I going to be able to take a punch, or you know, if a middle linebacker is running at me, you know, which is <laughs> better than a hundred-pound girl? Absolutely. You know, I'm 250 pounds. Um, but, you know, at these classes, uh, some of the classes, we do quarterly classes that are ladies-only classes. Uh, and we do those whether we switch it up. Sometimes it's carbine, sometimes it's pistol, sometimes it's shotgun. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll get these gals, my wife included, who is a small gal, um, you know, they're running 12-gauge with big boy loads. So they're shooting double out buck. But the recoil mitigation techniques that we go over in the video and talk about all that, we're just using body you know, our bodies to get a mechanical advantage over the weapon. It's just basic right. physics. So, you know, more surface area with our stance, with the way we position our rifle inboard, away from our shoulder, because our shoulders start acting like big levers taking us off center, so we twist and we mm-hmm. react, different things like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and two, the body positioning that I, I teach, uh, you know, on the videos, it's more natural with what you do under dynamic stress. You know, so it's kind of, you know, you're, you're an aggressive stance because your brain does not know the difference between a fist fight, a knife fight, a gun fight. It just knows you're in a fight. That supercomputer right. kicks in, it starts dumping chemicals, and it's game time. Yeah. So that's that's the way it works. So everything we do is teaching you to work with what your body does naturally. So we're not trying to reprogram the machine. But, again, it comes down to training. And to do the training, we've all heard the term, you bring up muscle mass, so I'm going to bring up a different term that's commonly misused in our industry, Muscle memory. Mm-hmm. Muscles don't have brains. They don't have memories. It's a misnomer for saying build it into your subconscious. Our mm-hmm. brains are run 80% off of our subconscious mind. And what that means is, like, yeah, think about when you're 16 driving a car for the first time. Man, checking the mirrors, doing this, doing that. It takes you three minutes to get out of the driveway. Now you've got, you know, your, your, your Bluetooth on, you're talking on the phone, you've got a cup of coffee, you're doing this, you're yelling at the kids in the back, you're switching lanes, and you haven't been in an accident in 15 years. Just because you're so used to doing it that that repetition, you know it cold. And it's the same thing with firearms training. The more you can do it. And and the biggest thing I tell people, and I don't care what platform you're running, 
you can do all this without necessarily going to the range. Dry fire practice. You ask anybody that served in the military, we did so much dry fire practice, I mean, to the point where you would ad nauseum. I mean, it's just like, oh, my God, I, I really wish I just had heat stroke right now so I didn't have to keep stay out here for another five <laughs> hours of dry yeah. fire. Yeah. You know, so it's, you know, but you're doing it. But you get, you, you know it so well that when everything kicks off, those chemicals start coming through. It doesn't matter. Your subconscious mind takes mm-hmm. over. And you're yeah. doing everything exactly as you're trained. So could, that's, uh, could that's you tell kind me a little bit about your? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, could you tell me a little bit about your uh, military history? Yeah, uh, I was a force reconnaissance marine. Uh, worked for some other places while I was in the Marine Corps, and you know, uh, had had some good experiences, had some bad experiences. Uh, I ended up getting injured, and after 13 years, I got medically retired. Uh, I didn't have to get out, but it was one of those things like, hey, man, here's your desk. You can hang out and mm-hmm. ride this thing, or you can go do something else. And, you know, as far as I was concerned, after 13 years, I was extremely fortunate with my experiences and, you know, my yeah. deployments, the fact that I was still alive and I had all my arms and legs. Um, I got medically retired from the Marine Corps. Mm-hmm. And uh, I do a lot of uh, work now helping disabled vets because uh believe it or not i'm a i'm a hundred percent disabled veteran and you know uh it's it's one of those things that when i got out it was it was hard for me to walk up the stairs uh it was hard for me to do a lot of things yeah and uh you know working with guys out there you know just switching up different things keep training keeping your mind strong um you know, and, and being willing to help yourself instead of falling into that victim mentality you know using the yeah. same skill sets that we learned uh and me in the Marine Corps, you know, to keep mentally tough when I was out there. It's the same mental skill sets I use to keep tough here. And, you know, I've had, gosh, uh, seven knee surgeries. I just got a new hip. Um, you know, I've got nerve damage on my right side. I've got titanium holding my left, my right arm on. I've got all kinds of cadavers and grafts on my left side. So pretty much on my left side, I'm all organic, but, you know, I've got some aftermarket yeah. parts in me on the right side. But, uh, wow. you know, it's just you just, just just keep pressing forward, you know, and keeping that mindset yeah. with the guys and, and instilling that with them um, when we're out on the range or we're just working, you know, doing consulting work, developing products and trying to make tools better for the guys that are still out there in the fight. I can't Definitely. fight anymore, but I can, I can do my damnedest to, you know, help out the guys that still are. And, you know, the guys that are coming back that, you know, might not have a lot of guidance or, you know, are terrified because they see stuff in the media about how shitty the VA is and all these other things. And, uh, yeah. you know, again, kind of going through, you know, hey, man, you know, the different experiences and sharing with them, talking with them about things and just just in listening when they need to be heard, you know. Yeah. Man, I, I couldn't imagine, you know, what you what you had to go through and, what uh, all the other heroes and warriors out there have to go through. And uh, I personally have never served, uh, um, but I have mad respect for you guys and what you do. Um, and the fact that you, you know, lend uh, a helping hand and, and, and an example for uh, other warriors to come to and uh, if they need something, I'm sure, you know, or they want to train with you guys. <clears throat> it's awesome. And I, you know, I, I respect you a lot for that. And, uh, you know, thank you for your service. Um, I, well, thank I mean, you for your service, man. Enough, I mean, man. That, that that means a lot. And I guarantee you ask any of us. And, you know, it's definitely, I mean, looking back, I mean, hey, it's hey, it's great. I get to still help people and do stuff. But, and it, you know, me serving in the military, was the coolest thing I'll, I'll ever do in my life. And it was, you know, my greatest honor to do so. And, you know, a, a lot of my, my training counterpart guys will probably tell you the exact same thing. And it's it's really cool to, you know, still be in a position to help people. And, you know, you're still there to kind of help and, you know, mentor the guys that are coming out. So it's uh, – you never leave the family, man. And it's, right, uh, it's, right. it's, a, all it's a really cool thing. Yep. Yeah. That's awesome. Absolutely. Man. That's great. That's great, uh, you know, and come to you uh, for training and, you know, also somewhat of a family support, you know. Um, that's that's really awesome, man. And, again, thank you. Thank you for serving. Uh, I, oh, I appreciate honor, it myself. Man. Thank you. And that basically concludes all my questions for you, man. Um yeah. Thanks again for your uh, for your time. I appreciate it. All right, Tom. Take care. All right, Mike. Have a good one.